how do we take those results, interpret them, and make sense of them in a way that we can use them to help inform good risk management decisions, right? Okay, first, talk a little bit about understanding results. I'm gonna put some images up, graphs, plots, tables, whatever, ask you some questions, and just shout out answers, raise your hand, however you wanna do it. What do you see here? Everyone see this all right? This is life loss, this is life loss estimate here. This is time of breach, so time of day that the breach occurs, so all the way from 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. And each one of these lines represents a warning relative to that breach zero time. It's uh, hard to make out some of the colors, but this is your base right here, right in the middle. And this red one is the no warning. So what do you see here? Anything that looks odd. Life loss is worse yeah. for times closer to the event? Okay. It, right. So life loss is higher in some cases when there is a warning. Spike at the end? Okay. Nighttime versus daytime is a leading influence. You kind of, why do you see this dramatic drop off at 6 a.m. and then see it pick back up at night? What that would might tell you about this area is that it's it's largely residential right a lot of people leaving the area during the day to go to work to go to school fewer people there right and then in some cases no warning like someone said you said earlier is is actually a little better why might that be yeah you didn't get out in, onto the streets and put yourself in a worse situation you're in your structure which generally has more integrity and a higher stability threshold than a vehicle would right exactly what could you say about this plot looking at it this down here is warning issuance relative to breach so breach is at time zero right here in red this is x-axis is in minutes y-axis is life loss again and these each one of these dots represents an iteration in, in life soon. So what could you say about this plot? So what, what time zero tells us is if they, we don't warn people until the breach occurs, life got loss goes up pretty dramatically, right? So we probably can, what, what this tells us is that life loss is pretty sensitive to when we issue the warning. And so we probably have a significant population at risk immediately downstream of the dam, right? Whereas, whereas if it were further downstream, you, you wouldn't see as much of a slope or a much a as much of a reaction in the density of these points. It would, it would just be spread out and kind of be flat, right? So the fact that we see it like this. So when we look out here, you know, several hours before, max mobilization rate is the primary factor. We're warning people several hours before. It's, it's that max mobilization rate. You've heard a lot about that this week. Jason talked about it with Orville, right, when you showed the, the Butte County and the um, Sutter County examples, you know, what, 85% 80, of people evacuated, right? So what that would tell me is if, if we use that 85% rate that this, you know, but this group that's clustered kind of between 100 and 1,000 life loss is that it's, it's, we're sampling around that 85%. And so sometimes we're sampling maybe 20% remains, maybe it's 10%, but that works out to somewhere between 100 and 1,000 where we've got some amount of people that stay behind and we get this life loss estimate. Then we jump above 1,000 if warning goes out, you know, in an hour or less prior to breach. And the reason being probably is that there's a lot of people immediately downstream of the dam, right? Um, let's look way out here, and I know the legend's right there, but you see life loss, this is already after breach, and then it, it jumps up a little bit. Why might it increase if warning goes out after breach? Into the flood, basically. People evacuate too late and end up kind of like with the last graph, end up in, in a worse situation. Um, 
Another reason is that people further away from the dam might have less time to take a protective action, right? So if we warn way out here several hours before the breach, people further away from the dam are more likely to have an opportunity to take a protective action and leave, plenty of evacuation opportunity time. If it's after the breach, that starts to have more of an influence as you move further downstream away from the dam. So this is a stacked bar chart. And so we've got the type of structure over here and then the colors represent the number of stories. Looking at this though, don't get, don't get too caught up in, you know, how colorful it is. Considering the structure distribution, what time of day would you expect life loss estimates to be the highest? Yes. We've got all these residential structures, right? Now, there are other factors that could impact how high your life loss might be. But if this is the only piece of information you had, that would be a reasonable, that would be a reasonable takeaway. Now, if I told you that, and then Jordan says, "Yeah, but Jesse, along the river, we've got these really deep areas, and those are largely." industrial and commercial structures, then that might make you think, okay, so flood characteristics for in these non-res structures are likely to be worse than in these residential structures. So that might be another piece of information that you have to take into account, right? But from this plot alone, saying that life loss would be higher at night is a very, is, is a perfectly reasonable assertion. Overtopping, three foot of overtopping, failure event. Now these are incremental results, right? We've Everyone's pretty clear on how we estimate incremental consequences for a dam breach. Yeah? Okay. Everyone's nodding, so I, you get it. I don't have to explain. All right. So these are incremental life loss estimates. So you see 160 during the day, 150 at night. For a breach prior to overtopping events, so this is an overtopping event. For a breach prior to overtopping event, same project, life loss increases about a full order of magnitude. Why would incremental life loss be higher in a situation where the reservoir level is more than 20 feet lower and we're sending less water downstream? Unexpected. What's that? Unexpected. Okay. So how might you say that? So early warning, yeah. because we know the dam's going to overtop. So we'd have that non-breach warning that would move a lot of people in, in higher risk areas near the river, right? That's correct. So situation where we aren't releasing water downstream, maybe it's not overbank in areas downstream, particularly population centers downstream. So we haven't issued an evacuation order versus a situation where Water's been, been coming up for hours, days. It's, getting over, it's gonna get over bank downstream. We're able to predict that several hours ahead of time because of our ability to forecast what our reservoirs are doing. We can start to move people downstream, get them out of those higher risk areas. And then even when that breach occurs, even though we would expect there to still be significant potential life loss, that early warning is gonna help mitigate all right, so this is the dam breach location right here. Red is depths greater than 40 or 50 feet. What would you expect life loss results to be sensitive to in this, in this circle area? Maybe detection, hazard recognition time. You know, when do we say, hey, this is, this is gonna fail? Because it's, it's so close. Jordan's point about when that warning goes out, it's probably gonna be a pretty high percentage of population at risk that ends up being exposed to the flood, right? What else might drive life loss in this area? The, the topography a little bit, really, really deep flooding, right? You've got a concentration of, of depths over bank that are, you know, well above 20 feet in a lot of areas where we've got structures and people. So immediately downstream, not a lot of time to leave. And then we've got hydraulic characteristics that are likely to put people in 
situations that have historically led to mortality, right? If we put this same situation 60 miles further downstream, what would you expect to, to drive life loss further downstream? Okay, so potential for life loss on roads further downstream. People have the chance to get out on the road to evacuate, and if they don't evacuate soon enough, they'll be on the road when the water comes through. Okay, anything else? Mobilization rate, yep, absolutely. So as we move further away from any flood defense structure, we're often, there's, there's the hydraulic characteristics, right? Like you heard Corby say yesterday, Without the water, we're probably not going to have flood-related consequences, right? So the, the hydraulic characteristics matter, but then whether or not you, you leave, whether or not people take a protective action and actually leave. As you move further away, that's more likely to be sensitive to that mobilization rate, the likelihood of taking that protective action. When you're closer, it's really more about when that warning gets issued, because if that warning gets issued after this dam, or this is an impertinent structure, but after this dike breaches, we're really not going to get to sample. We're, we're really not going to be thinking a whole lot about mobilization rate. Everyone's going to be sheltered in place, and it's going to be more about the, the flood characteristics at those shelter locations, right? All right. Despite the disparity in the po incremental PAR estimates, and this is going to, we talked a little bit about this already, right? Two foot over top in the dam. This is one foot below the spillway crest. So incremental PARs is quite a bit larger here. So we're still saying non-breach PAR, we've got our breach PAR. Our incremental population at risk is about on the order of 30,000 people higher for day and night than for this one foot below spillway event. In spite of that disparity, what scenario could lead to life loss being higher for a failure here at that one foot below? Exactly right. So, again, that early warning can play a pretty significant difference, right? Because you'd, you'd say, well, think about the flood characteristics. Yeah, you might have pretty significant depths and velocities in certain locations for this group, closer to the river, but you're, in a lot of cases, you'd probably have, you, you know, you'd have more water coming through. Depths might be greater, velocities might be greater in some places, depending on the hydraulics. And so it's really about how, how many people are actually exposed, right? It's that exposed PAR estimate that we're trying to get to. And with that earlier warning, we might really limit that exposed PAR estimate. All right, interpreting and using results. This is where the rubber hits the road a little bit. Did anyone know what Dan this is? It's been in, talked about quite a few times over the years. It's okay if you don't, just, just curious. All right, so this is a life loss dot plot. And we've gotten away from those a little bit. We're starting to use heat maps, so we're showing concentration rather than you know dot plots which show life loss estimates and structures or mean life loss estimates and structures. Red is greater than 10. Orange is 3 to 10, and then the little yellow is, is less than 3. You can see con a concentration here, concentration up closer to the dam, and another one down here. What potential risk reduction measures could you identify using just this information? Yeah. What's driving life loss right here? You're right. Warning issuance. So maybe put a siren on the dam. Some way to warn those people quickly. Um, what's driving life loss in this area further downstream? It seems like it's converging higher depths there. Okay, so you see some you see some darker coloring in the depth grid, so maybe the hydraulic characteristics are worse. Maybe the mobilization rate. Um, so knowing that we've got a couple areas further downstream where we're seeing some ponding, where water gets deeper. You know, you mentioned early warning, maybe a warning system that alerts people immediately downstream of the dam to an emergency. 
maybe a threat matrix that says, hey, you know, let's activate the siren at such and such a threshold, or let's let these people know earlier because we know that this is where water's going to pond. That's the type of information we can get from doing this kind of modeling, right? All right, this is kind of a funny one. I want to draw your attention to the, this column all the way to the left. This is a dam failure, and then this is that same dam failing for the same event with that causes cascading dam failure at dams further downstream. So if this dam fails and none of the dams further downstream fail, they just pass the flows from that breach, our median life loss estimate is this 2156 number. And then if those dams further downstream do breach, so we've got cascading breaches, our estimates, this 1713 number. Now, why do you think this number would be lower than this number? So life loss in pool? Your inundation area is smaller. Inundation area is smaller for the cascading dam failure? Okay. I think, I think you're getting there. It's, the reason was for this particular project is that exactly that, the water level in one of the downstream reservoirs got appreciably higher than it would have if the dam breached, and that caused a fair amount of life loss in the pool. This is kind of an interesting case. Um, Kurt Buchanan, for those of you who know him from the Corps, sent me this because I asked him for interesting cases to try to stump people for this particular lecture. I have not stumped you guys yet. You're doing great. All right. Now we're going to get into justifying the results a little bit. So we went through that kind of quickly, but you, you've got these different things that help you understand the factors that are driving life loss, right? Now I want to make sure that these life loss results that I have and that I'm delivering to the rest of the team so that we can come up with good risk estimates and make good recommendations makes sense, right? You don't want to just, hopefully, no one just ever runs a model and then just blindly takes the results and dumps them into a report. Um, models are powerful tools. They're, they're not replacements for your, for your noggin. So justifying the results, I'm going to bring all of these up here. Key factors when you're thinking about justifying life loss results. We talked about most of them. Where along the dam or levee is, is that failure expected to occur? So particularly when you're talking about failure mode specifics, um, levees, levees certainly have length effects, but even with dams, you know, where that breach happens relative to populations and development can have an impact on your results, right? So think about talking about that and explaining that. That should be an important part of your narrative. Certainly the flood characteristics, right? If you see a lot of life loss in an area that's got sheet flow, you might wonder why, but you know it also might be from vehicles getting out on the road and, and getting caught, maybe erroneously in your model, but it, it could make sense. Or you just have a really large population at risk, large number of people exposed, and even though we're sampling these really low fatality rates, low probability fatality rates, we've got enough people that that increases your number. <coughs> Excuse me. Those are all important things to talk about. Breach parameters. I didn't get into those a whole lot. Um, Jordan, you worked with Kurt on that breach sensitivity stuff, right? So Jordan and Kurt just did some some interesting work testing the sensitivity of life loss results um, to to different breach parameters, and I I don't want to get into it too deeply, I guess I would say that in some cases it matters and in some cases it, it doesn't and <laughs> it, it depends, but certainly something to consider and when you're thinking through particularly um, different potential failure modes, the nature of the breach can make a difference, you know, whether it's slowly developing and water starts to enter the floodplain and move slowly back upstream towards your population center, that could really impact how you might think about life loss, even if you hadn't explicitly modeled that type of scenario, right? 
Um, emergency preparedness, we've talked a lot this week about, you know, availability of earlier warning, potential evacuation potential, things like that. So, you know, those Jason had his his presentation yesterday where he talked about warning and protective action initiation to, took you through that timeline, talked about the Orville example, certainly those factors that you know, one of the biggest challenges of doing this is trying to figure out how many people might actually be exposed to a flood. And there's a great deal of natural variability in that number. And, and so it's it's not an easy number to estimate, and there's a large amount of uncertainty. But any information we can get and apply that understanding to our life loss estimates, that's important. And then availability of egress routes, right? Um, at least in in the software we use at the core life sim you can you can simulate evacuation but it's also an important consideration even if you weren't using a, an evacuation simulation all right so we're going to do a couple of socrative exercises and how these are going to work is i'm going to describe a situation um there'll be graphics then you'll have i don't know probably five minutes to go through the socrative exercise and then we'll talk through it I think based on how well you guys did with the, the leading questions, the Socrative exercises are going to be pretty straightforward, but here we go. Uh, dam sits up in the mountains, 15, up, 15 miles upstream of a major coastal city. Coastline is only 30 miles downstream of the dam, so relatively, relatively short inundation track, right? Up in the mountains, down to the ocean, not unlike Montecito. The reservoir boundary is defined by the jagged mountains that surround it, as well as several pertinent structures that help mitigate flood risk at higher pool levels. First 10 to 15 miles of the 30 miles down to the ocean are steep and narrow canyon, right? You've got a concentrated flow path. Many residential neighborhoods and small communities along the canyonized reach. Below the canyon is a wide and flat valley that extends the ocean. And this is where the, the large city is, right? So this is where most of your population is. Outflow from the dam, whether from spillway release overtopping or from embankment breach, inundate the small communities in the canyonized area before spreading out along the broad alluvial fan at the base of the mountains. All right. So this is our example failure mode. Um, late January, uh, that the fact that it's January is, is not significant, so I won't, don't let that throw you off. A lot of rain for the previous 48 hours. Spillway was constructed using outdated construction practices. Spillway slabs start to unravel, leads to head cutting, continues back to the OG Weir monolith, uncontrolled release of the pool. This breach progression and development takes about four hours. Immediately downstream in the canyonized reach, depths exceed 25 feet and water moves quickly through the small communities towards the valley below. The bottom of the canyon, the flood spreads out far and wide. See the image to the right. So this is the pool right here in red. This is that canyonized area, that first 15 miles here. And then once it gets down to the base of the mountains, it's, it does indeed spread out far and wide. So the red is greater than 15 feet. The yellow is 6 to 15 feet. The dark blue is 2 to 6 feet and the light blue is less than two feet of flooding. Um, so that's the information you have. Question number one. What input parameter is life loss likely to be the most sensitive to in the canyonized reach immediately downstream of the dam? Um, most of you got that correct. All the above. Imminent hazard, warning issuance delay, and ultimately that first public alert all of those things contribute to how how short or long that warning might be relative to the imminent hazard so answers all the above any questions about that what parameter is life loss likely to be most sensitive to in the city below the dam mobilization rate um, warning issuance because it's a relatively short distance between the dam and the ocean possible that warning issuance would life loss results would be sensitive to warning issuance as well but um, as we move further downstream we we generally expect mobilization rate to to be the 
parameter that life loss is most sensitive to. What drives the mobilization rate? Message and content, right? The most powerful tool an emergency manager has is their messaging and their message content, right? That's good messaging is, at least with the research that we have from Dr. Maletti and Sorensen, the factor that's most likely to elicit the protective action response that you're trying to get from the public that you serve, right? So messaging content. This is not supposed to be a trick question, um, but there's a couple answers that you could you can make the case for being correct. Um, I think this got a few people. But what might we be able to say about evacuation in the densely populated city in the valley below? So the wording is a little, a little funky, but. If you were to evacuate, it's fair to say that transportation congestion would probably be a factor because there'd be thousands of people in a densely developed area, right? Major city, a lot of people trying to get on roads all at once, you'd expect traffic congestion to be a problem. Now, you might say that because of that, people would be better off sheltering in place. So, this, this isn't wrong. Where is life loss most likely to occur in the city downstream of the dam? The flood map showed some pretty deep depths down by the coast. Yeah, yep. Four spots in there. So, yep, I had six to 15 feet. Yep. Water, water depths went way up. There was a shallow depths all through the majority of the city. And I think mm -hmm. So uh, A seemed like a good answer based on that. Yeah. Okay, so, so in those single story structures near the coast, maybe? Yep. It did say it was, it said daytime, mm -hmm. but it did say weekend. Yep. So you just had to make an assumption of people would be at home. Yep. And it, it certainly could be, given how many people could be on roads if an evacuation was ordered. I'd generally be more concerned about life risk on roads, but very fair to say, depending on what emergency response when that warning went out what the messaging looked like that it's possible that people in those you know if they were still in their structures closer to the coast that could be what what drives life loss right all right so i'm going to finish that one. Oh, you want to see the results yep on roads but we did talk about the single family homes does it, I'm sorry, does it have anything to do with? With the escape routes being cut off, the inundation? Certainly, yeah, it certainly does. The, the extent of the inundation can play a significant role in evacuation potential, right? And if you knew something like this might happen, and if you had good inundation maps where, like you said, you could see depths are relatively shallow in certain areas, um, maybe as an emergency manager, you, you'd want to consider shelter in place. When it comes to flooding, and flood emergencies that stem from dam breach, generally emergency managers are, are less comfortable with the idea of, of shelter in place, which is presents some challenges in a situation like this, right? Where um, depending on when that first public alert might go out relative to the emergency, shelter in place might be the best option. If you have enough time, evacuating people makes a lot of sense but in an area like that that's really densely developed for several miles north and south of that wide inundation track it's fair to wonder um, you know given given how many people are there and the carrying capacity of the roads what evacuation potential truly is good comment so if you had if you had several hours evacuation might be possible if you had an hour or two you know, maybe not so much. Next one. This is a levy. Um, levy not too far from St. Louis. And this is just a distribution of structures. So you can see at the bottom of your screen there, um, 
there's kind of that concentration on the eastern side, but most of the structures are upstream on the northern side of the of the levied area, right? That's where that's where most of our structures are. You can see the legend up there, all these different dots that are hard to see the different colors of with the lights um, represent different structure types. I can tell you that they're mostly that dark purple, which is which is residential, but they're relatively interdispersed with, with non-residential structures as well. Um, what you want to take away from here for this particular exercise is really just structure location. Where, where do I have a concentration of structures and people? All right, these are the consequences estimates right here, and I'll keep these up for you. Um, we're going to have a couple PFMs. First, we're going to go through this failure mode where the breach location is up at the top of the screen right here that little star is so there's another it's another there's a small trib right here then this is the direction of the main stem and the levee does wrap around along this trib breach right here remember that we've got structures immediately adjacent to that breach location right here so what this heat map is showing is concentrations of our life loss estimates so you can see no surprise, those concentrations are in areas where we've got structures, and then the yellow red, where we've got a higher concentration of life loss, is in that area that's that little neighborhood that's immediately adjacent to the breach location. And our incremental breach estimates, life loss estimates, are, are somewhere between 100 and 200 generally, at least in the median, right? All right, so at that particular breach location, We've got annual probability of failure between 1 times 10 to the minus 4 and 1 times 10 to the minus 3. Critical loading is 0.2% um, event or 1 in 500 annual probability of occurrence. Then some talk about how erodible the soil is, which I'm sure I had a geotech help me with. Uh, and then Detection and intervention were considered to have a low likelihood of being successful. So the risk estimate is right here, somewhere between one times 10 to the minus, or the, our annual probability of failure, somewhere between one times 10 to the minus four and one times 10 to the minus three. That takes into account the likelihood of failure and the probability of that loading condition occurring. For this particular event, these this is our range of life loss consequences estimates right um, warning time so what you should take away from this is warning time is likely you know we're consider it short since we don't have any non-breach consequences right here you see so we don't have overtopping or not forecasted overtopping anyway so we're not we, we're not assuming that there's an early warning um, one in 500, and then we've got pretty erodible material. So we came up with this estimate that there's a relatively high probability of poor performance and failure. Um, life loss is, is generally greater than 100. You know, if you're using log scale, you could argue that's somewhere between 30 and 300. Um, and then you, you see these day and nighttime estimates. And, when we're reporting life loss consequences, we generally report both day and night. But when we're thinking about <clears throat> life risk and, and how do you take these two and combine them, do we just take the worst case and say, all right, worst case is this happens at night when everyone's home and in their beds, that's when we expect life loss to be highest. So let's estimate risk based on nighttime. Or do we take the daytime estimates into account as well, which show that there would be still pretty significant potential for life loss. One thing we can do is use exposure weights and, and come up with a single estimate where we would say um, we're at home for 10 hours out of the day and we're away from home for 14 hours of the day. So we'll apply those exposure weights to the two different estimates and come up with an exposure weighted life loss estimate. <coughs> All right. So in this particular case, 
because we're generally in that 100 to 1,000 range, we might place that box right there, right, for this particular failure mode. Now for the exercise, what I want you to think about is, this is the information you have for this particular failure mode that we just went through, right? Here's our incremental life loss estimate. Our interquartile range is, is generally all over 100. I do have some estimates below 100, so maybe you'd say 30 to 300 and move this box over. But we went ahead and said 100 and 1,000 to make it, make it straightforward enough for this exercise, right? All right, now, this is our first failure mode, right? We just went through that. We know that we plotted right here on that risk matrix, which you've seen before this week. We're just talking about semi-quantitative estimates, right? Order of magnitude, let's place this box in the right place on this plot relative to the societal life risk line <clears throat> and, and then go through the other potential failure modes. What if we have that same annual probability of failure but the embankment composition is a little different. It's not, the material is not as erodible. Still, still same probability of failure. The change in embankment composition isn't enough to shift our annual probability of failure estimate, but maybe it could affect what the breach looks like, right? So we have these estimates for life loss for this event up here because we simulated it in our life loss software. But we're actually looking way down here in reach C. If this same, if, a, if we've got the same estimate of likelihood of poor performance for this second failure mode, PFM2, and these are the only life loss estimates we have available to us, even though they're representative of this location up here and we know we've got people and structures up here, I want you to think through how you might estimate what, how that different location might impact those life loss estimates and how might that change where you place that box on the plot, right? Life loss is likely to be higher at the downstream PFM2 breach location than at the PFM2 location than at the model breach location. Is that true or false? All right, false. We'll see you had that. So that breach, if you remember where the structures are located <clears throat> on the upstream side, generally, of that levied area, breach happening further downstream where water needs to back up into the levied area before it really reaches those population centers, you'd expect probably people to have more opportunity to, to evacuate, right? more time to take a protective action. Um, the nature of the flood characteristics is gonna be a little different, whereas that upstream breach location, you had that neighborhood right adjacent to the breach where you might have greater depths and velocities immediately adjacent to the breach. Water's gotta back up into that area. It's probably gonna be moving a little more slowly, right? So, you're right, false. We would generally expect life loss to be lower in situations like that. Although only a single breach was modeled to estimate life loss, what statement could you make about life loss associated with a breach at PFM2? Most likely driven by the mobilization rate and depths of flooding. Looks like this one tricks people a little bit. More life loss on roads because people have more time to evacuate, whereas before the breach was immediately adjacent to the population center. So it, it's good to be thinking that way. You know, we've talked about people getting out on roads. You saw that uncertainty plot in the beginning of this where we had all the, we had the dot plot and we said, all right, if people got out on roads, that could increase potential for life loss because their stability threshold is going to change being in a vehicle rather than being in a structure, right? But because our population center is, is further away from the breach, water's got to back up to get there, probably expect more people to have time to take a protective action. So that mobilization rate and the depths of flooding, because those hydraulic characteristics in the population centers are going to be a little different if 
that breach location were different. Those are the two things I expect to be driving those life loss estimates. The likelihood of failure is the same for PFM 1 and 2. Which direction would you expect the box on the FM plot to move? East or west? That's right. So the only thing that's changing is that if the likelihood of failure, the y-axis isn't going to change, the only thing that changes is that x that x axis estimate, right? Considering what you know about what drives life loss, select the life loss range for PFM2. Now, this is going to show that there is a right answer, but it's it's all about the case that you make, right? Like Stephanie was just saying, you might have information that compels you to say life loss belongs in this range. 10 to 100, okay. I had a lot of people say 30 to 300. I would have said, hey, for PFM1, where we've got these life loss estimates that modeled that particular breach at that location, we've got modeling that's representative of that breach, 30 to 300 might make sense. You know, that really covers the range of outcomes that you saw in that five number summary. And so we're accounting for the, for the various uncertainties associated with life losses to come up with that estimate because we've got that representative breach. In this case, because we didn't model this particular event, and Brian, I don't know how many times we had to have this conversation with those lactolevies where we hadn't modeled it, <laughs> still come up with an estimate. You, you'd probably say, if, if I'm thinking, all right, maybe not this one, now, you could, you could still make the case that you think it should be 30 to 300, but you'd have to really work to make that case. I think you could make the case, all right, well, my whole range is 30 to 300. Because I'm moving that breach location further downstream, hydraulic characteristics might look a little different. People are further away, might have more time to move. I think I can make the case that that life loss estimate should be half order of magnitude lower than than what that range looks like. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up with this 10 to 100 answer. So I, that's what a lot of you got to, and I, I would say well done. Um, I appreciate how attentive you guys have been